Monsters is a podcast about the worst human beings on the planet. The episodes of this podcast deal with murder, dismemberment, torture, rape, child abuse, and mental illness. Please turn back while you still can. Listener discretion advised. This is part two of the season finale of Monsters. John John Chuck Jr. has had custody of his daughter, Phoebe, for about two years. He has become erratic, made concerning statements to his lawyer, and visited several churches in an effort to get baptized. When his efforts were unsuccessful, he returned to his father's home where he had been staying with his daughter. His world is crumbling around him, and he is about to take his rage and jealousy out on his own daughter. This is Monsters. Come back and find out that he's deceased. Tapping me on the head, telling me I'm cheating, telling me I'm, you know, let me see your phone. Just kill her, and she dies. I think Diego Campione is totally in the wrong, and I hope he burns in hell for all his sins. Hell's not a very fun place. I only have two hands. I'm not four hands, girl. I'm two hands. And her nose just get escalated and escalated. <laughs> At about 10 p.m. on January 7, 2015, John John Chuck Jr. put all of Phoebe's Christmas presents into plastic bags and loaded them into his car, a white PT Cruiser. He then put Phoebe in the car, with no coat or even shoes, and left the house. His father, John John Chuck Sr., and stepmother, Mickey, heard him leave, but thought that he was just dropping Phoebe off at her grandmother's house and went back to sleep. John Chuck went to the apartment of a friend named Nomi and was pounding on her door. He had texted her earlier that night, claiming that they were meant to be together. In one of the messages, he told her that he had asked a priest how many people had jumped off the Skyway Bridge. Nomi didn't respond, so John Chuck went to her residence and tried to get her to come to the door. As Nomi hid in her bedroom, Phoebe stood in the cold, with no coat or shoes, while her father tried to get Nomi to answer the door. Nomi would later say that she didn't know Phoebe was with John Chuck and thought that he wanted to kill her. After pacing the parking lot for a few minutes, John Chuck loaded Phoebe back into the car and left. Officer William Vickers had ended his shift and was on his way home when he encountered John Chuck on the road. Just after midnight, did you observe something unusual as you were approaching the southern tip of Pinellas County? I did. Can you tell the jury what you saw? Uh, as I was southbound, I, I noticed in my rearview mirror a car overtaking me at a high rate of speed. Uh, I, anticip- I estimated that car to be traveling approximately 100 miles per hour. I was southbound at uh, 70 miles an hour in the median lane. And this was on Interstate 275? Yes, sir. Going south? Yes, sir. Approximately where were you on Interstate 275 when you observed this? Right about the Pinellas Bayway 54th Avenue south exit. Can you describe the vehicle? What kind of vehicle was it? Uh, it was a white Chrysler PT Cruiser. And approximately what time did you see this? Uh, just after midnight. Okay. And did you see the vehicle in your rearview mirror or after it had passed you? At what point did you first see the vehicle? Uh, I saw the vehicle approaching in the rearview mirror. I was able to identify the type and make of vehicle as it passed me. Okay. And what happened as it passed you? Uh, As it passed me, it whipped between myself and another vehicle that was also southbound, uh, causing us to both take evasive action, and the speed with which it passed me moved my vehicle on the roadway. Officer Vickers radioed to alert other officers to look out for the vehicle. Due to safety protocols for when officers are allowed to initiate a traffic pursuit, he didn't attempt to accelerate and stop the PT Cruiser. It wasn't long, though, before he encountered the vehicle again. As I came around that bend, uh, just prior to the Pinellas Point exit, I saw the vehicle very hard on the brakes, uh, a long black skid mark on the, re- on the roadway, as well as smoke emanating from the rear tires. Okay. Was he hitting his brakes? Yes. What happened next? The uh, vehicle then began driving at a, a fairly normal rate of speed, and I didn't accelerate to catch up. I, I caught up on normal speed. Uh, At that point, I determined, let me go ahead and try a traffic stop because the vehicle is then driving in apparently a normal manner. Um, 
basic safety for initiating a traffic stop is to obtain the tag, uh, identify how many drivers or how many occupants are in the vehicle, um, any identifying information about the vehicle, and trying to determine a place to stop it, predicting a, a possible stop. The reason I want to get all that information is should something go wrong in the traffic stop, it's already there. Because if I were to initiate a traffic stop without that information, we may not have a lead if something were to go wrong. So what did you do next? I got behind the vehicle. I called out the tag. Um, at that point, we're approaching the Dick Meisner Bridge. The anticipated place where I wanted to make a stop for safety reasons would have been the base of the Dick Meisner Bridge. Conducting a tra traffic stop at a, on a bridge or at the top of a bridge is inherently dangerous, especially on the highway. It's a very narrow shoulder, uh, and there's also very limited visibility. What happened after that? Um, as we reached the approximate top of the bridge, uh, the vehicle pulled over abruptly prior to me activating my lights and sirens or anything like that. Um, when the vehicle pulled over abruptly, I immediately pulled over. At that point, I turned on my lights, um, and the driver exited the vehicle, so I also exited the vehicle. So would you agree that the vehicle stopped without you having conducted a traffic stop? That's correct. And to choose the location that you would have preferred? Absolutely not. You would have preferred either the other side or the base of the bridge before you begin the incline. Is that accurate? That's accurate. John Chuck stopped his car in the middle of the Dick Meisner Bridge and got out. Uh, the driver was already out of the vehicle and began approaching me uh, with something large in his hand. Uh, based on training that I've seen at that point, I was fearful for a violent encounter. I drew my firearm and maintained it in a low ready with the anticipation of a, of a firefight. Uh, the driver continued to approach me. I ordered them back into the car. Uh, they did not respond. Uh, as they continued to approach, the driver yelled, you have no free will and crossed in between uh, the two cars. Uh, at that point, the driver walked around to the passenger side uh, and reached in. I ordered the driver to show me their hands. They still did not comply. At that point, I was still anticipating a violent encounter, possibly firearm related. <coughs> the driver emer emerged from the vehicle holding a small child. Uh, <coughs> who appeared to be asleep at the time, uh, turned and let the child go over the side of the bridge. John Chuck pulled Phoebe out of the car, held her over the side of the bridge, and let go. He didn't make any attempt to jump as well, just dropped his daughter off of a 62-foot bridge, knowing full well that she did not know how to swim. What was your reaction after you dropped the child off the side of the bridge? I was immediately concerned for the child. Uh, I advised radio of what had happened. Um, I was shocked, but immediately my concern is to try the health, welfare, and safety of the child. Did you hear anything when the child was dropped from the top of the bridge? I did. I heard a, a faint scream and a splash. What happened to the defendant, the driver of the vehicle? Uh, the driver returned to his vehicle, crossed between our two vehicles, and left. Which way did he drive? South on 275. Toward the Skyway? Yes, sir. And what did you do? Uh, immediately ran to the edge of the bridge, uh, looking for any sign of, of life, uh, some, something in the water. Uh, I didn't see anything at all at that point. Uh, it was very cold and windy that night. Um, my options were limited. I did notice that there was a uh, service ladder to the left of me, which would have been the south. Uh, immediately climbed down the service ladder, uh, calling the entire way down, and worked my way down to a uh, like a safety bumper area for the supports for the bridge, where I continued to call and try and look for the girl. You mentioned it was cold. It was. About how cold was it outside at that time? It was in the 40s. Low 40s or upper 40s? I'd say low 40s. What were the winds like? Uh, winds were gusting over 20 miles an hour. At a couple of points, I was nearly blown off of the, uh, the bumper walkway area at the bottom of the bridge. John Chuck got back in his car and drove away.
but Officer Vickers stayed on the scene and attempted to save the young girl that he had just witnessed being dropped off that bridge. I continued to call until uh, a fire rescue boat arrived in the area. At that point, I got on fire rescue boat 11 uh, to assist in searching and coordinating between police and fire resources. Did you ever see Phoebe in the water when you were at the base of the bridge walking that cattle? I did not. How long were you on the fire department boat looking for this child? I estimate approximately 45 minutes. Were you, pay, were you paying close attention to the time or were your thoughts elsewhere? I was not. Just, I looked at my watch a couple of times thinking, we got to find her, we got to find her. What happened when you were on the boat? Uh, we continued to search. Eventually we were alerted that uh, Eckerd College Search and Rescue had located a, a child's body in the water. And what happened next? Uh, our rescue boat responded to Eckerd College Search and Rescue's location, at which point we transferred uh, the body of a small child from their boat onto fire rescue. Uh, I immediately began compressions for CPR. Officer Vickers performed compressions on Phoebe after she was recovered from the water, but unfortunately, it was no use. An autopsy would later reveal that she had drowned, and it was confirmed that she was alive when John Chuck dropped her into the water. Officer Vickers had all of his focus on Phoebe, so other officers were alerted that John Chuck had fled and they were on the lookout. Officer Jenna Gillis was also on her way home when she heard about the incident over the radio. She turned around and began looking for the white PT cruiser. She heard another officer radio that he had located the vehicle. She headed his direction and joined the pursuit shortly after. As you proceeded northbound, did the PT cruiser do anything unusual? Uh, yes. What? Um, as uh, Officer Sousa initiated his uh, lights and I activated my lights, the um, suspect vehicle make an, made an erratic U-turn. Um, in the middle of the interstate and headed back towards my direction in my lane. Is there three lanes going north at this point? Yes. Okay. You were in what lane? I was in the center lane. Uh, describe the U-turn that the PT Cruiser made. Uh, the PT Cruiser made a turn from the, um, the right lane all the way and made it into the median lane coming back at me head on. So you were going head to head? Yes, head to head on the interstate. Uh, were your lights on? Yes, lights and uh, sirens were activated. Right. As you closed the gap toward each other, what happened? Um, I tried to see if I could move around. I remember there was a semi there to my right, and Officer Sousa was actually in the left, in the uh, median lane, which was on my, my left. So as soon as I could, I got out of the way of the uh, suspect vehicle. Um, which way did you go? I went far right as soon as I could to correct and come back around behind him. So at that point, Officer Sousa was following him? as he headed south in the northbound lane? That's correct. Uh, could you see the driver when you were head to head? Yes, I could. Could you see anyone else in the vehicle at that time? Nobody else was in the vehicle that I could see. Okay. Uh, when you turned around, did you follow Officer Sousa and the white PT cruiser? I did. Uh, so now the three of you are going the wrong way down... 75. 75. At some point, were you ordered to stop that pursuit in the wrong way? Um, it's, it's per our general orders to not pursue the wrong way on the interstate. So as soon as I was able to correct, I had to exit off at the Ellington exit um, and re-enter going the correct way on the interstate. Did Officer Sousa also get off at Ellington and get on the correct side? Yes, we both did. Did you lose sight of the white PT cruiser? For a moment, we did lose sight of the vehicle. Were you able to regain it when you were on the correct side of the road heading south? Yes, we did. John Chuck began driving the wrong way on the highway, putting multiple other people's lives in danger. Eventually, they were able to stop the vehicle. Did there come a time when the vehicle was stopped? Yes, the vehicle did come to a stop. Oh, where was that? It was just before the university exit on 75. And how was it stopped? Uh, there was police officers that blocked the interstate and prevented him from continuing. Were stop sticks used as well? Stop sticks were used. What are stop sticks? Uh, stop sticks are uh, spikes that go through your tire and let the air out very slowly. That way, to help the vehicle come to a stop if somebody's fleeing or trying to get away. Officer Gillis describes apprehending John Chuck. When you stopped, uh, what did you do? 
Um, once I stopped, I had pulled into the median and uh, hopped the median, went out, um, and uh, attempted to <coughs> take custody of the defendant. Okay. Uh, how far did it take? How far did you have to run? Is it called across a lane? A few lanes. Uh, and were you the first officer to reach the vehicle? I don't remember I was, if I was the first. Um, there were several of us out there. Uh, did you have a weapon drawn? Yes, I did. I had my gun drawn. Did other officers have their weapons drawn? Yes. The um, defendant was doing what? He was sitting in his car uh, looking forward. Okay. Where were his hands? On the steering wheel. Was he saying anything? No. Was he being given orders? Yes. What orders? There were several several orders being given to him. Um, I don't remember verbatim, word for word. But generally, what were the orders? Um, keep your hands where we can see him. Uh, step out of the car. I mean. So he kept his hands where you could see him. None of our orders were. Did he follow, he follow that instruction? Did he get out of the car? He no, he wouldn't get out of the car. Um, the door was locked. His seatbelt was on, so we weren't able to really get to him at that point. The window was also up. Well, how did you get to him? Officer Sousa had to actually break his uh, his driver window. What did he break it with? Uh, an asp. What's an asp? It's a, a tool that you usually have on your belt. A lot of officers carry. Um, you, it's a it's like a baton and it extends. Kind of like this. Kind of but much like that, but heavier. Yes. Uh, was he then removed from the vehicle? Yes. Was he saying anything at that point? No. What happened next? Um, after we pulled him out of the window, um, we got him handcuffed, and he was then walked to a cruiser. He's walked to where? A cruiser. Okay. Your cruiser? No. John John Chuck Jr. was arrested and taken to the police station for questioning. He immediately shows that he's annoyed that he has to sit in a room, handcuffed, and wait for Detectives Miller and Cruz to come talk to him. Where's the detective that's supposed to be speaking with me? Where's the detective that's supposed to be speaking with me? He's getting information. He'll be right here, okay? I just want to go to bed. I don't want to talk to anybody. Let me be right with you. And I don't have to. What's that, John? I don't have to. You don't have to do what? Talk to anybody. I know that. So can I just be done with or whatever? Mm -hmm. I, that's not my call, buddy. You know? Poor John. He has to be inconvenienced by the detectives who want to talk to him about why he dropped his daughter off of a bridge. Don't they know he's tired and wants to go to bed? I also find it fascinating how clearly John Chuck is thinking here. He knows that detectives are coming to talk to him, and he's showing impatience. He understands that he has the right to remain silent. It's almost like he's not really suffering from any mental illness, or if he is, it's only happening at selectively convenient times. Hmm. Detectives Miller and Cruz finally arrive, and John Chuck doesn't want to talk to them. He just says no to them and puts his head down on the table and ignores them. Hey, how you doing, John? Detective Miller with St. Pete. Hey, John, okay. you <laughs> We're just gonna, uh, you, you, I'm sure you got some questions for us. Okay. Um, so, but before I do, I have to read your, your Miranda rights, okay? And we're going to have a two-way conversation if that's all right with you, okay? Um, okay, you don't want to, you don't want to talk? No? Okay. Well, can I just read these, this form to you, and then you can decide after we're done with this form? No. Okay. John, I understand. I I understand you're concerned about your your daughter, right? John. John. They finally get his attention by mentioning his daughter, and he agrees to have a two-way conversation about her. They read him his rights, but it's not exactly clear what they talk about because there's a point in the interrogation video that clearly jumps, showing that some of the interrogation is missing. But we do know that he talked to them about having custody of Phoebe and his problems with Kerr. Then the mental illness comes back into play. Something is not right because people are coming in here. I've never said anything about Michael. And like besides out of church today, this lady comes in and gets inside of the police car with me when I'm in the back. 
and Terry and starts telling me this is insane. Okay. okay. Right, Just give us a couple minutes, okay? Thank you. Being manipulated. That's what's going on. Conspiracy, conspiracy, conspiracy. Apparently, John Chuck believes that this is all a conspiracy. While John Chuck was waiting to be interrogated, he talked to a deputy where he said something very telling. Is he okay? Amy? Who's that? He asks if Phoebe is okay, but when the deputy asks who Phoebe is, John Chuck responds, quote, Phoebe was my daughter, end quote. He already knows she's dead. While detectives were, well, trying to interrogate John Chuck, officers had obtained a warrant to search his vehicle. They found empty cigarette packs, half-eaten food, and Dolce & Gabbana cologne. They found the bags of Phoebe's Christmas presents in the back of the car. On the passenger seat, they found the black bag that John Chuck used to carry around the large Swedish Bible, plus a Gideon Bible that was open to Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 11. You divided the sea before them, so that they passed through it on dry ground, but you hurled their pursuers into the depths like a stone into mighty waters. John John Chuck Jr. was charged with first-degree murder, aggravated assault on a police officer, and aggravated fleeing or eluding. In his first court appearance, he continues to lay the groundwork for an insanity defense. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. You are John John Chuck? That's the name that I was given. Okay, thank you. You're here on a charge of aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer, and your bond is currently set at $10,000. You're here on a charge <coughs> excuse me, of aggravated fleeing or eluding, and eluding a police officer, and your bond is set at $10,000. You're also here on a charge of murder in the first degree, and you have no bond. Can you hire your own lawyer? Do you have the wherewithal to hire an attorney, sir? No. Judge, Would, I'm sorry to interrupt. Has he been sworn? He has not been sworn. Would you like me to hire an uh, appoint an attorney to represent you? No. Are you sure? I want to leave it in the hands of God. Okay. So you want to represent yourself? I want to leave it in the hands of God. Pretty sure God's not going to be representing you in this case, and you're going to be standing trial. Would you like someone standing next to you as you're standing trial? Yes. An attorney. That is pure and good, not evil. I'm going to do the best I can to give you a pure and good lawyer. If you'll raise your right hand. He's handcuffed, Your Honor. Can he raise his right hand? I don't want a court-appointed lawyer. I want to leave it in the hands of God. Point Dr. Poorman. Out of everything he does, it's my opinion that his attitude is genuine. From what people who knew him said, he was quite an asshole. The judge tries to get an answer out of John Chuck, but he can't, so he has an appointment set so he can see a psychiatrist to determine if he's competent to stand trial. After some time at North Florida Evaluation and Treatment Center, he was deemed competent to stand trial, and he was assigned public defenders. I'd like to note that his lawyers stopped the trial at one point claiming that John Chuck's mental health was deteriorating, and the judge sent him to be evaluated by a psychiatrist who determined that he was still competent to stand trial. Nobody who knew John Chuck believed that he was insane. One friend claimed that he had told her that if he ever got into trouble, he would claim insanity. John Chuck's uncle, Brian Morris, believed that his nephew knew exactly what he was doing. He said, quote, John's smart enough to build an insanity case ahead of time, end quote. Others pointed out that he had studied to be a paralegal and knew the system very well. Studies by the National Institute of Mental Health and the Canadian Mental Health Association have found that violence caused by drug or alcohol abuse is nearly seven times more likely than violence caused by mental illness. 
Stories about a schizophrenic person assaulting or killing someone are blown up in the media, but are actually fairly rare. If someone who suffers from mental illness also abuses drugs and alcohol, the likelihood of violence increases even more. We know that John Chuck smoked spice and meth at various times in his life, both drugs that can increase violence and paranoia. John John Chuck Jr.'s trial started on March 18, 2019. The prosecutor describes the two theories of the crime in his opening statement. Mr. Ellis explained to you in jury selection that we have two theories to prove this murder. The first is premeditated murder, and you'll learn that in order to prove a premeditated murder in this case, we would have to establish that number one, Phoebe John Chuck is dead which is not being questioned. Number two, that that death was caused by the criminal act of John John Chuck Jr., which again, we will prove to you. And number three, that there was a premeditated killing of Phoebe John Chuck. You will be told that as it concerns premeditation, killing with premeditation is killing after consciously deciding to do so. The decision must be present in the mind at the time of the killing, and the law does not fix the exact period of time that must pass between the formation of the premeditated intent to kill and the killing. There's no set time in which that premeditation has to form under the law. But the period of time must be long enough to allow reflection by the defendant. He has to know what he's doing and has to have had reflected on it. And the facts of this case will prove that the defendant had time to reflect about what he had done when he stopped on the bridge of his own accord, exited his vehicle, went to the passenger side, pulled Phoebe out, and dropped her. He goes on to explain the second theory. The other theory that Mr. Ellis discussed with you in jury selection is that of felony murder. And you'll remember he gave the illustration of the arsonist who burned down the house, didn't intend to kill someone who had crawled in the house to get away from the cold. In order to prove felony murder, and keep in mind, felony murder is first-degree murder. The state would have to prove that, number one, Phoebe is dead. Number two, that while engaged in the commission of an aggravated child abuse, the defendant caused the death of Phoebe John Chuck and that the defendant was the person who actually killed her. In order to prove felony murder, you'll be told it is not necessary to prove premeditated intent. So the felony for this case for felony murder is aggravated child abuse. And just using your own common sense, you can all see how taking your child and dropping her off the side of a bridge would be aggravated child abuse. You'll be told that the definition of child abuse means an intentional infliction of physical injury upon a child or an intentional act that could reasonably be expected to result in physical injury to a child. The evidence will show that the defendant's actions were an intentional act reasonably likely to cause physical injury, and we know in this case, his act caused her death. The defense was set to argue that John Chuck was insane at the time he dropped Phoebe off of the Dick Meisner Bridge, so the prosecutor made sure that the jurors understood exactly what the defense would have to prove. You've been read a jury instruction for insanity, but I'm going to read it to you again because it's important and we need to consider it. And we need to consider carefully what these words say. A person is considered to be insane when he had a mental infirmity, disease, or defect. But the analysis does not stop there. Someone is not insane just because they have mental illness, just because there's something wrong with them, or they may say things that sound strange. Number two, because of this condition, He did not know what he was doing or its consequences. To be insane, John John Chuck Jr. would not know what he was doing at the time that he dropped Phoebe off the bridge. If he believed he was doing something else, 
anything else. But the evidence will show that when the defendant, John John Chuck Jr., dropped his child off the side of that bridge, he did know that he was killing his child. He did know what he was doing. He knew the nature of his act. And there's an or. The second part of that is because of this condition, he didn't know what he was doing or its consequences. Or although he knew what he was doing and its consequences, he didn't know it was wrong. This is what you have to consider for insanity. And members of the jury, the evidence in this case will show that the defendant not only knew what he was doing when he killed his child, but that he also knew it was wrong. It's true that the defendant is considered innocent until proven guilty, and that burden of proof lies on the prosecutor. It's also true that the defendant is considered sane until proven insane, and that burden of proof lies on the defense. The defense called forensic psychologist Dr. Scott Macklis to the stand, who explained how John Chuck had spent his whole life suffering from mental illness, and how he became psychotic before dropping his daughter to her death. Supposedly, John Chuck believed that he was making a sacrifice to save the world. The prosecutor had little trouble casting doubt on Dr. Macklis's testimony. He brings up the inclusion of an episode of hallucination by John Chuck in Dr. Macklis's report, and makes it clear that that episode could have easily been caused by drug use. And as far as the one instance in Dr. Arthur's records that talked about a possible hallucination with the skin bubbling, or do you know what I'm referring to? Yes. You can't testify today that that wasn't drug-related, can you? No. In November 2014, the defendant told you that he heard the voices getting louder. Do you recall that? Yes. All right. And in September of 2014, he also heard the voices getting louder, right? That's when they initiated, he reported. Now, he reported to you that in September of 2014, when the voices were getting louder, he noticed that when he was using drugs, that that had an effect on the voices getting louder, right? That it increased it, yes. That increased it. What kind of drugs was he taking in September of 2014 when the voices were increased? Uh, he reported that he was smoking spice. And what else? Uh, he used crystal meth a couple of times. Now, as a doctor who's conducting your sanity evaluation, you have to eliminate drug use on the date of offense, correct? Yes. Because if he's on drugs when he commits the murder, then he's not insane, right? That is what case law says, yes. Dr. Macklis admits that John Chuck had been using spice and crystal meth at the time he claimed that voices were getting louder. The prosecutor also points out where Dr. Macklis used one part of a police report that would help the defense, but ignores a different part of the same report that would hurt the defense's case. In that police report that, that you relied on, you testified on Friday that there were references to demons, correct? Yes. And that the defendant had told Melly Dishman she's possessed by a demon. Right? Yes. And you relied on that, correct? That was one piece of information that I relied upon. And you testified to that on Friday to this jury, right? Yes. Within that same police report, within that same statement, Melody Dishman also made another statement, didn't she? Yes. Okay. And I think you were going to talk about that on Friday. You reviewed that as well, correct? Yes. All right. In that statement, Melody Dishman reported that the defendant told her her being Melody, that if he ever got in trouble one day, that he would claim insanity. Correct? Yes, when he was 12 years old. Right. And he said that to her, according to her, when they were 12. Right? Correct. But at the time that you reviewed that police report, you didn't know how old the defendant was when he said that to Melody, right? Correct. You didn't know the context of that, correct? Correct. You didn't know where they were when he made that statement at the time that you reviewed that police report, right? Correct. But yet you discounted that statement in your opinion without knowing the context of it, right? No. Did you know the context of it? I did not know the context of it. Did you call Melody Dishman and ask her what the context of it was? No. Did you do any research to try and find out what was the situation when he said that statement? No. But you didn't reference that in your report that you provided to the defense, did you? 
that statement that the defendant made to Melody Dishman, you did not reference that in your report. I have to go through my report to, to see if it's in there. Do, would you like to take the time to do that? Yes. Dr. Macklis checks his notes. I did not see it in my report. Right. So you cherry-picked from that interview with Detective Miller parts that were good for you and excluded a part that was bad. Correct? Yeah, argumentative. Overruled. Correct? What I put into my report and what I used as evidence and information in expressing my opinion was information that was corroborated, information that there was extensive information about that I could really use that information to give an opinion regarding that information. And as just was indicated, there was no context for that statement, there was no timeline for that information. And just as it came out in her deposition, this was a statement that was made at 12 years old, which to me is inconsequential in regards to the offense in which we're talking about. But you've already testified that in your opinion, we go all the way back to five years old when we talk about his mental health, correct? Yes. So childhood is important. And what, they, what happens in childhood is important, right? Depends and to a degree. What's most important is the time period before, whether it be weeks, months, maybe a couple of years before, certainly what happened in childhood is less important than what was important in one's 20s, in, in this case, in John's 20s and moving forward. Well, you would agree that childhood is important if you're looking at the defendant for a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder, correct? No. No? No. A conduct disorder is required in order to have a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder, and that conduct disorder has to begin in childhood. Yes, yeah, so first you would be looking at the diagnosis of conduct disorder when they're in childhood. Right. That's my point. And that's in childhood, correct? Correct. All right. So what's confirmation bias? Confirmation bias is when you go into a situation, even a forensic evaluation, you go into a situation with the result in mind, and then you look at evidence that just points to that conclusion rather than looking at all hypotheses. The prosecutor's arguments were effective. And the doctor that they presented, who said that she didn't even believe that John Chuck was mentally ill, let alone insane, must have been more convincing. In April of 2019, John Chuck was found guilty on all charges. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The defense did everything in their power to keep their client out of prison. I have never seen a court case have so many breaks for counsel to sidebar with the judge. This was four weeks' worth of court video, and it got to the point that I would grit my teeth every time I heard a defense lawyer say, Objection! Approach! It would happen up to 15 times a day. They would turn off the audio and all huddle around the judge's bench to hash out what a witness could say or exactly how it could be worded. The defense had gotten the word psychopath completely barred from anybody's vocabulary. They also got testimony from a paralegal thrown out. She had claimed that the day before Phoebe died, John Chuck told her not to worry about his custody case and said, quote, If I can't have her, no one else will. End quote. It turned out that the prosecution hadn't disclosed that statement to the defense ahead of time, so it got tossed. They didn't quit at a guilty verdict, though. In August of 2019, they filed a motion for a new trial, arguing that the prosecutor made claims in his opening statement that weren't supported by evidence. They also claimed that the court admitted evidence of John Chuck's prior bad acts that shouldn't have been admitted. The judge addressed the defense's concerns and determined that the motion was without merit and denied it. He would have had 30 days to file an appeal on that decision, but there's been no news on him since the motion was denied. Thanks so much for joining me on the first season of Monsters. I'm going to take a short break to spend the holidays with my family and prep for another season. In January, I hope you'll join me for Monsters, Season 2, Love Kills. Thanks again. If you like this show, please subscribe or leave me a rating on whatever podcast app you use. On YouTube, you can subscribe, hit like, or leave me a comment. If you'd like to support the show, you can donate a few dollars through Buy Me a Coffee. You can click the link on our website or YouTube channel, or 
go to buymeacoffee.com backslash monsters. If you shop on Amazon, you can go to our website and click on the Amazon banner, where you can purchase items at no additional charge, but will get a small commission. I'm always trying to increase my content and improve its quality, and your support will help me do that. Thank you in advance.